Good evening and welcome to the October 13th meeting of the Bloomington Planning Commission. The Planning Commission is made up of seven volunteer Bloomington residents appointed by the City Council. Tonight we have four, which is a quorum. The Commission advises the City Council on development proposals, development standards, long-range planning, and transportation issues. Our work is informed by the City's comprehensive plan, various district plans, and the City Code. For some items, the Commission makes a recommendation with the City Council having final decision-making authority. In other cases, the Planning Commission can approve or deny an application subject to an appeal to the City Council. This is the case for two items on our agenda this evening. For each item, action item, there will be a staff report, an opportunity for the applicant to present, and then time for any member of the public to provide testimony. Our first order of business tonight is the Pledge of Allegiance. Please stand as you are able. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <laughs> All right, uh, Mr. Markergaard, would you please share uh, how the members of the public not present can provide testimony? Chair Roman, commissioners, uh, we have two public hearings tonight, and uh, anybody in the audience can testify during the public hearings, but if you're at home, you can testify as well. Uh, remotely, what you would do is call the number on the screen, uh, enter the access code, and then we'd be able to pass you through. Uh, we will have this number on the screen uh, throughout those public hearing items tonight. Thank you. The first item is a request for a conditional use permit for an indoor entertainment and recreation facility. Uh, for those who may follow the commission, this is an item we've seen before. Uh, the previous approval by the commission expired after one year, so this item is here for reconsideration. Um, I would ask uh, Planner O'Day for the staff report. Thank you, Chair and Commissioners. Item one on your agenda this evening is for a conditional use permit for an indoor entertainment and recreation facility in an existing multi-tenant building at 8901 Penn Avenue South. Most of you may know the intersection here. It's at the northeast corner of 90th Street and Penn Avenue. Surrounding uses to the east and to the north are single family, and then to the west and the south are office and retail business uses. Um, this tenant space is 6,000 square feet in highlighted in yellow in the Penn Lake Center. And as Commissioner or Chair Roman had identified, this came before you last July. And uh, this is the same request. And that CUP has expired after one year of no building permit issuance. Uh, there are, four, are 22 pool tables and bench seating around the perimeter of the space. They would provide prepackaged food and beverages, and then for the public's information, no alcoholic beverages would be provided. And then three miscellaneous items. Uh, the applicant must provide a sidewalk connection from the building entrance to the public street network, and then their hours of operation are from 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. daily. And then lastly, the applicant has provided a public safety plan that identifies items such as loitering and uh, curfew, and that has been approved by the police department. And then lastly, we have received two emails, one in support and one opposition. Uh, you have that at your seats this evening, and with that, staff is recommending approval. This is subject to an appeal, and the applicant is here if you have any questions. Thank you for that. Uh, one question I'd like to start with is, the last time this was before us, we had a number of things that, that the commission uh, added as conditions. Can you share those items that we added? Those are incorporated in the, the standard proposal this time? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, so there's one condition related this evening that's uh, related to the hours of operation. So they would be restricted to the 10, their um, proposed hours operation, which is 10 a.m. to 2 a.m. daily. And then they provided the public safety plan, which identifies some of the possible nuisances. So we didn't include the um, three verified nuisance related condition that we had last time. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Okay. The applicant wished to speak on this item, if you wish. You come forward if you'd like. If not, that's up to you. 
pretty much in the staff. Go ahead and go ahead and come on up to the mic. It's, um, Paul Webster. It's pretty much in the staff report. Um, we've met the conditions. We deleted the 24 hours um, after not very long deliberations. Just eh, the staff is older that we're going to have on staff, and we don't want to be there all night. So um, that's pretty much it. Uh, the staff report pretty much covers everything. Um, if I can, if I'm asked to speak after the public, I'll be more than glad to do that. Great. Any questions for the applicant? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. Um, Mr. Webster, my question is related to traffic um, when you do have these tournaments. Can you describe a little bit to us um, what, when you have a tournament, does everyone come at the same time? Does everyone leave at the same time? Uh, what is traffic uh, no. like for these kind of things? I, sure, I'll be glad to answer that. If we have a Saturday or an evening tournament during the week, those aren't generally too big. It could be a big tournament on a Saturday or a Sunday, but there is 300 parking spots. And as players are limited, or eliminated, they tend to leave. They don't tend to stay till the bitter end. Um, you know, we can't have tournaments with hundreds of players. You know, they're going to be, be due to the size of the complex, uh, you know, with 22 tables. Uh, we'd be hard-pressed to have a tournament of more than 32 or 48 players. So if that answers your, helps answer your question. Other questions for the applicant? Yes. Uh. <coughs> Thank you, Chair. Um, my concern is billiards can be extremely loud, and I'm wondering if um, there's any kind of soundproof between um, the other businesses that will be installed. Well, the other businesses close fairly early where our peak hours are late. Okay. And yeah, that's a that would be a question for my rep, I guess. You know, um, I we're not going to have loud music because typically the tournament players don't like it, and the league players, you know, on a moderate level, probably about the same as what would play in city hall elevator. I guess I don't know. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? Other questions for the applicant? Thank you. Thank you. Um, this item is a public hearing, and so I will open the public hearing. Any member of the public who's interested in speaking, I would ask you to come forward, sign your name on the registry, uh, and then you'll be recognized. Uh, our rules of procedure do allow three minutes for speaking. If you uh, reach the three minutes, I will let you know, and I ask that you please uh, wrap your comments at three minutes. So the public hearing is open. Hi, uh, my name is Carolyn Hansen. I actually live behind the strip mall. I actually live closer to the the, um, the north side of the strip mall. And I guess I don't really have too I mostly have comments. I guess I'm concerned about the hours. I think 2 o'clock in the morning is too long for a business to be open when there are homes right behind the fence and behind. And so I, as far as his safety protocols go, I don't think you can ever keep anybody from loitering in the back of the building. And we also have concerns about they're going to be clean they or open until 2 in the morning, but they still have to clean up. So they're going to be in the back at the dumpsters and working back there. So I guess I just think that the hours are kind of ridiculous to be open until 2 in the morning when nothing else in the neighborhood is open until 2 in the morning. Considering that there's homes, I think that this business would belong more in like an industrial area where there aren't homes right behind, and those are my concerns. So thank you. Thank you.
Good evening, <clears throat> and thank you very much for hosting uh, this important meeting tonight. I'm Jim Lund. I live at 8754 Logan. I think the hours are a little too late for this residential area. I don't mind the occasional Bloomington Kennedy football game going a little bit later. I don't mind the occasional sporting event uh, hosted by Bloomington Jefferson. Can live with that. I think we all can appreciate that as a game might go to overtime. However, 2 a.m. on a regular basis in a residential area, it just doesn't work. And I think that there are some better options, maybe closer to the Mall of America. There might be some better options. I know that this was explored in West Bloomington, but it just, it's too residential. And some of the other things that I, I think are important to note is uh, there's a lot of wildlife in this area. We have a lot of owls. We have a lot of fox that are nocturnal animals. I don't think the noise, as you alluded to, uh, Gene, is not conducive. And it, it's just, it's not good for the wildlife. It's not good for the neighborhood. And I just, I'm not, a go, I'm not opposing business. I just think that there's a better venue for it. That'll be my time. And thank you very much for hosting this meeting. Thank you. As I seem to recall, there was a petition or some type of communication with nearby residents when this was first proposed that encompassed an area of like, what, 250 feet from the proposed site. What was the response to that? The public hearing, uh, go ahead and let us know you're at, and then we make our notes. And the My name is Richard Hagen. I live at 89 no, I mean, Morgan. We, the commission will respond um, after the public hearing has ended. We will follow up with questions that have been asked. We, it's not a back and forth. All right. I, sorry, didn't realize that. As long as I've got a couple of minutes. You're good. Um, go ahead. It's a bad idea. Don't do it. 2 a.m., We've already had an attempted murder in that site. We've already had another murder a couple blocks down the street. We have had break-ins. We have had assault at the liquor store, which is going to be very close to this place. I don't see a lot of improvement that's going to make this a better part of our neighborhood. I really don't. No offense to the developers, but uh, please take it somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, and thank you for allowing us to speak. I, um, my husband just spoke. I, I'm also at 89 and Morgan. Um, I also am concerned about the hours of operation. The developer or the proposed applicant, um, I believe, has said that there would be no alcohol on the premises as far as the owners are concerned. I would like to ask if there's any provisions for not allowing any alcohol or any type of um, beverages or any other type of uh, thing that's going to maybe raise the level of concern for the neighborhood and the, um, the players, the visitors, the residents in the neighborhood. So I'd like you to look into that as well. Um, if alcohol is allowed to be brought into the site, that's a big concern. There's a liquor store that's going to be within a very close distance of this venue. And if players, I, I, I don't, you know, no offense to the players or the developer, but um, if players are allowed to bring in their own beverages, alcoholic beverages, I think that's a big concern. So the hours and, the, and, and that are a big concern for me. 
the hours of operation seem to be um, not conducive to what we would consider a very close residential neighborhood. I'm not against any development in the area, but to me there are other properties in the vicinity that could use some positive development and that might be might be a better focus for this committee than this type of development. Um, so uh, please consider that in your decision. Thank you. Thank you. My name is Katherine Anderson and I'm on Penn Lake Circle and I also am agreeing with all our other um, neighbors that the hours are just too late for that neighborhood. Nothing is open in that mall really past 8 o'clock, which I'm not against like late hours, but 2 a.m. for a neighborhood is just too late. And there's so many other places, I believe, in, Burn in Bloomington that would better suit this location. And I know you're going to answer questions later, but there was another location that they had that was denied, and I guess it was based because it was a, not a commercial, but w were there complaints from the neighbors in that neighborhood also? And uh, I'm just curious, like, how long do tournaments last? Like, is there a need for it to be open at 2, or uh, do they have a tournament every night? Um, and are they interested in getting a liquor license down the road? I know that's really where the the money comes in where you really can make some a bigger amount of money and it also states that it was going to be 18 and over are they going to be like checking everybody's ID that comes in there because I'm sure a lot of 16 year olds want to go play pool at like midnight and and what is the safety plan like I really haven't seen that if we could address that after so thank you thank you Hi, my name is Lisa McIntyre and I also live in the neighborhood and I just wanted to show my support for my neighbors and uh, reiterate, some, reiterate some of their concerns. I also have a concern with the uh, hours of 2 a.m. We do have football games, as Mr. Lund mentioned, but they're rarely past 10 and it seems like that would be a more reasonable time limit for this particular neighborhood, especially given that there are single family homes on two sides of the development as Ms. O'Day showed you in the illustration. I do have one question and that is about the public safety plan. I wanted to know who enforces that plan and what the consequences are if the plan is violated. For instance, loitering, if there is a lot of loitering observed, is it the police that would note that or is it up to the community to call in and then once that's verified, does it put the permit at risk of loss or is it just monetary penalties? That's my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Kathy Kelly, and I did <clears throat> email, I guess it was Liz, regarding my thoughts um, on this enterprise coming into a middle-class neighborhood with hours until 2 in the morning. And uh, you did make some uh, note that the police were okay with it, but the first time it came around, uh, when I went to um, Holiday to pick up something, there were uh, two policemen sitting there, and I said, well, what do you think of 
this um, billiard hall coming in, and both of them emphatically said no. I've, I uh, regret that I didn't ask them why. Um, I'm assuming they are the ones that would have to babysit if the police are called because of loitering. Um, and I agree with um, uh, the others' thoughts that this is um, not something uh, for um, a middle-class neighborhood. It could go down to Southtown, and, um, but everything closes at 10 or so around there. So um, I would just hope that you would have them look elsewhere for a place. Thank you. My name is Mary Bass Fluke. I live at 8918 Newton. That's one block. It's right behind where this venue would happen. I was present last year when uh, we spoke to this. And I remember uh, the question coming forth directly to the gentleman who was here to represent the venue asking if they would ever consider pursuing a liquor license. And he said, well, I'll be right out front. We probably will within a year's time. So I want to remind you of that. I also want to speak to the fact of what all my neighbors have said. I'm very disappointed that this has come forth again. I'm very disappointed that supposedly it was approved last year by the police. And again, to share with you my experiences living where I live. I walk a dog back along behind there oh, almost every day. There are empty liquor bottles. I'm not saying that's the venue, but there is a liquor store there. There are kids who play back there. There are bicyclists, there are skateboarders. There are also uh, people that I have witnessed defecating back there. Um, this is my home. This is where I bring my grandchildren who stay overnight with me. There is no way that my daughter will allow that to happen if this is going on in my backyard. And I just want to share with you, this is my backyard. This is not a commercial area. Please listen to your residents who pay a tax base also. Thank you. My name is Jay Hansen. I live at 8900 Newton, Avenue South, Bloomington, Minnesota, right behind the strip mall. And I'm kind of curious of why we're here again, discussing this again. We have the same complaints past 10 o'clock. Uh, as far as parking, I'm looking at the map of parking, and if the dollar store is open, that parking lot in front of their venue is full, along with all the other parking for all the other customers that are open. So if they're going to have leagues, you know, they're not going to carpool. They're all going to drive separate. Where are all these people going to be? You know, where are they going to park? You know, I just don't see it. I don't see our, our, our 
the entrance and exits of this place working for all that traffic. Just don't see it. Um, you know, I'm glad that you know they're filling up the strip mall, but under the circumstances, I don't see it. There's just too much traffic. And we do have a noise complaint. I see in here you have a note for dumpsters inside. Uh, that would be wonderful for if everybody did that there. I've got a dumpster behind my, behind my house. If they drop that, it sh shakes my house. Doesn't matter what time of day. Uh, every time we they change disposal services, we have to go out there and tell them silent times from 7 to 10. Otherwise, they're back there at 4.30 dumping that thing. Um, and we do have a lot of riffraff behind the place, you know. Uh, we've got uh, Kevin, who was injured. Um, we've got problems with Kevin with noises. He's having aftermarket parties there, or after hour parties there, that uh, we've dealt with personally, but if it becomes a problem, we're gonna have to turn them in. And same with this venue, if they're gonna, you know, have the back door open. We can't have that back door open. We'll hear everything. Um, they should have fire doors for that anyway. They should be closed. Um, same with, uh, I, my wife spoke about the garbage. You know, they're gonna clean up at two, they're gonna be there till three. And if you ever gotten woken up at three, you don't get, go back to bed. You're up the rest of the day. So, you know, I welcome the business, but uh, you know, if you could, do 10 o'clock hours, I'd be glad, glad to have them in the neighborhood. But, you know, I, I don't know what kind of people, you know, shoot pool at 2 in the morning, 1, midnight. It's usually, you know, the old saying, nothing good happens after midnight. Thank you. That's three minutes. I appreciate your time. Anyone else who'd like to speak on this item? If you've already had a chance to speak, uh, it's, it, yep. Yeah. Um, Planning Manager Mark Gard, is there anyone online? Chair Roman, there appears to be two people online we'll check in with here. I'm going to start with uh, Dan Betts. Um, I will unmute you now. Mr. Betts, can you? Oh, uh, hello. Yeah. yeah, I was just uh, checking to see if the. Uh, that the pool hall or the billiard room or whatever was going to be opened up. Would you like to speak on that item? The public hearing is open. You have three minutes if you'd like to speak on that item. Oh yes. Well, in the in the past, I've uh, I've actually managed a, a, a billiard hall uh, back in the '80s and '90s. I think it'd be a real good idea for uh, for uh, entertainment and just trying to get people out and about again. But uh, other than that, I don't have too much to say. I was just kind of watching to see what was going on. I Thank appreciate you. appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. And I'm going to check in next with a caller uh, identified as Steve. Uh, Steve, I will unmute you now. Good evening. Hi. Are you calling to provide testimony on the billiard hall? He's muted still. All right, uh, Steve, I will unmute you again. Good evening. Are you uh, sorry? I'm, are you calling for this uh, item? Sorry, I'm. I'm not. I'm sorry. That's okay. Thank you. All right, um, that's everyone online, and I think that's everyone in the chamber. Um, so, given that, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. Second. A motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The public hearing is closed. Um, I want to follow up on a few items that I have some notes here from things that we heard. Um, Planner O'Day, can you talk about um, the dumpster situation at this property and uh, its compliance or its whether it's compliant, non-conforming, whatever it is with our, our indoor trash policy? Sure. Thank you, Chair Roman. Um, so upon review of the application, 
Um, upon review of some aerial photos, I noticed some dumpsters were stored outside that is in violation, so those dumpsters have to be moved inside. As part of um, this application, there is an indoor corridor, so there is space inside for those dumpsters. And so this property is, uh, it was not an exist, it, it, it's required to be indoors at this property? Correct. Thank you. Uh, and then to that effect, and then also I think it goes with a couple of other things, uh, is it correct that environmental health is responsible for enforcing those types of things? Uh, for the trash? Trash or other conditions of, of this uh, permit. Sure. So the Environmental Health Division is responsible for enforcing the trash. Um, as far as some of the nuisance related, that's more of a police department enforcement. And typically uh, through, across the city, again, it's not always 100% of the time. How, did, how does uh, environmental health become aware of, of non-compliant things that are in their realm, whether it be trash or signs or other things that are in there? Sure. So it's either through complaint that they um, go out there and inspect the property, or it's from routine drive-by. Thank you. Um, we also heard some uh, questions about um, carrying alcohol, and do we have any... Um, ordinances on that or any stipulations in this proposal that you would want to call out? So no outside food or beverages would be allowed to be brought into the space. Of any type? Of any type. Okay. Um, and again, in that compliance with that would be based on, uh, in this case, would be based on a complaint that was registered? Yes. Okay. Um, there was a I think there was a remark in our materials and someone mentioned uh, another location was considered. Uh, I don't, as far as the planning commission goes, that was not, that did not come to us. So there was nothing denied at the planning commission level. Correct. Um, that is correct? That's correct. So upon um, the applicant was going to go at um, 4200 Old Shakopee Road, upon review of that application, it did not comply with our comprehensive plan. So the applicant drew, withdrew his application before it got to planning commission. Okay. Um, can you share for the commission and the public, uh, should this uh, use be approved, should the use remain compliant with the stipulations of the permit, what would the process be if uh, there was interest in offering a liquor license. So that must go through uh, city council and there's a public hearing for liquor license. If it's of the desire of the planning commission, you could put a condition that no liquor can be served at this facility. Okay. Um, generally speaking, uh, again, I know this uh, retail area has a number of tenants that span a number of hours of the day. Uh, what is the general uh, nature of the status of this property as far as uh, complaints and enforcement? I am not aware of any complaints. Um, some of the other tenants in this building are restaurants. There's a Dollar Tree, some other retails um, uses, but I'm not aware of any complaints. Okay. Um, other questions, uh, I guess, follow up, any follow up before we go into discussion? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. I just want to um, go back to a question that Commissioner Roman was asking. Ms. O'Day, can you um, talk a little bit about what this property is zoned for and how it's guided in the comprehensive plan? Sure. Thank you, Chair. Commissioner Albrecht, this property is zoned B4, so that's neighborhood commercial, and the comprehensive plan designates it as general business, which allows for a variety of retail and service oriented uses, um, such as an indoor entertainment and recreation. So it does comply with both our zoning, um, which is a conditional use permit in the B4 zoning district, which is the reason why they're here tonight. So it does comply with both our zoning and our comprehensive plan. Thank you. Thank you. Um, at this point, I think we will um, move into discussion. Uh, and so any of the commissioners have uh, thoughts on this item? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. Um, I am in support of this moving forward. I think that um, it is it, the, the things that um, 
we had flushed out initially when it first came to the commission, um, including the fence, which I did note there is a new fence there, um, and um, some of the noise complaints uh, that already exist. Uh, one of the things that I had mentioned uh, when we first saw this item is that um, I, I do believe that eyes on the street and having uh, a business there versus having an empty space actually uh, helps the community. More eyes, more people are there to um, keep things in line, keep things in check versus having an empty space. Um, so I understand that there are concerns uh, about noise. I understand there are concerns about um, traffic. However, I do think that the findings were have been made uh, to issue this conditional use permit, and that is the purview of the Planning Commission, um, and that is how I um, will be voting today. Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. O'Day, can you clarify again about um, the last time this came before us, so there was a condition of three nuisance complaints. Can you just clarify again where we're at with that, with this application? Sure. So last time there was a condition related to three verified nuisance as identified in Chapter 12, I believe, um, that the uh, applicant must submit a public safety plan approved by the police department. So that condition has been removed and because that applicant has provided a public safety plan that address addresses uh, possible nuisances. Very well. Thank you. I think where I'm at with this, Mr. Chair, is that... Um, I'm not ready to assume something bad is going to happen before it has. I don't think that's fair of us to assume there's going to be noise problems, assume that liquor is going to be brought in, assume that bad things. The applicant has submitted a public safety plan. The, he's come here with an, uh, an honest application to the best of his ability. And um, if there are problems, the, that is then the purview of the police department and public health to take care of those things. And I'm not ready to assume um, negative things are going to happen before they do. So I am in support of this application. Thank you. Any other discussion? Um, you know, again, we, we spent a fair bit of time working through this the last time it was here. Um, if, if, um, if there's one thing I'm frustrated, it's that, um, you know, folks are, are feeling this this tension again, and we, we kind of went through this and had an opportunity to, to work through it. So I wish that this had gone forward and we learned what we got, if it went, you know, when we approved it last time, went in place and we, we found it where it was. Um, I think I, I, hear, I heard a number of things from the members of the community uh, about current problems that they're experiencing with the property. Uh, and what I, what I would offer feedback on that especially is, um, use the processes that the city has in place so that those are on record. Um, you know, we asked the staff about that because um, if they don't have those things on record, they can't ensure that enforcement. The things like the, the garbage, that's an obvious problem, and people shouldn't have to deal with that. Um, but if the, if the city doesn't know about it, they don't have a record to um, to take action with, with the property owner at large. So um, I am not uh, insensitive to the, the concerns that were raised, <clears throat> but it is, an allowed use, conditional use, in this facility. Uh, and so based on the conversations we had last time, the conditional conditions we recommended last time, which are now embedded into the base uh, proposal, I, too, am comfortable with this application. I think there are processes to remedy situations, as Commissioner Cookton said, if problems do arise. Um, and if the, if the neighbors do observe problems and they, and they use the processes that are in place, there are ways um, to resolve those and, and to ensure uh, that these things exist in harmony. So that's where I'm at. Any other discussion? Police have better things to do. Can't see. Can't see. And seeing no further discussion, I would entertain a motion on this item. Commissioner Cookson. Mr. Chair, in case PL 2022-176, having been able to make the required findings, I move to adopt a resolution approving a conditional use permit for an approximately 6,000 square foot indoor entertainment and recreation facility in an existing multi-tenant building at 8901 Penn Avenue South, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. 
Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? This is a final decision by the commission unless an appeal is received by 4.30 p.m. on October 18th. Thank you. Item number two is a request for a conditional use permit for a karate school in an existing shopping center, and I believe um, Planning Technician Navarro has the staff report. Let me take a second and let folks, sorry, I, was, I should have okay. given a second for folks to clear before we started. It's I'm my sorry. fault. All right, item number two. Good evening, Chair and Commissioners. Uh, for item number two, the applicant requests a conditional use permit for a karate school in an existing shopping center located at 5109 West 98th Street. Uh, the tenant spa space is 5141 West 88th Street. Uh, the school has been in operation since 2005 without any complaints to the city or the shopping center man management. Uh, the applicant is relocating their business from tenant space uh, 5109B, uh, which is circled in black on the map on the screen. Um, they're relocating to 5141, which is in the red circle, and it will occupy 2,923 square feet of lease space. Uh, so a little bit of history, uh, the City Council approved a two-year temporary conditional use permit in 2005, a five-year temporary conditional use permit in 2007, and a conditional use permit in 2012, uh, restricted to the tenant space 5109B. Uh, the change of space in the existing shopping center will require a new conditional use permit, which uh, that's why you see this application before, before you tonight. Um, the applicant, again, the applicant will occupy 2,923 square feet of lease space in the existing shopping center, um, as shown in the, this floor plan. Um, a staff review the existing lighting and landscape, landscaping close to the proposed site and uh, found no changes needed from the applicant. Um, parking has been suffi sufficient since 2005 uh, for this use, and since they're re relocating to another tenant space in the existing shopping center, a parking static, static was not needed. Um, with that, all findings were made, and staff recommends approval of the application. Uh, Planning Commission has the final approval, and the motion is on the screen. Thank you for that. Questions for staff? Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. Um, uh, my question is related to the conditional use permit issued in 2012 that was uh, uh, issued for a specific space uh, in that same shopping center. Is that a typical way to issue a conditional use permit to, for a specific space? Or is there a conditional use permit that just allows that use in the entire building? I think I'll defer to the planning manager. I don't know the whole history <coughs> of conditional use permits. Yeah, Chair Roman, uh, Commissioner Albrecht. So we have had that condition frequently applied in conditional use permits, but not always. So it varies. Some, some have them, some don't. Um, and there's kind of pros and cons to having such a condition. One of the cons is that uh, when somebody wants to move within the same center, then it has to come back through uh, for another review. Um, so in this case, we're not recommending that that condition be carried forward. Um, but that's why they're here tonight is because of that condition existed back when. Great. Thank you. Tech Navarro, has there been any uh, issues with this uh, business during the last 10 years of their condition use permit? No, uh, pl Chair, Planning Commissioners, um, we did some research and we haven't heard any complaints uh, about the tenant space. Thank you. Other questions for staff? Uh, Commissioner Cookton? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ms. Navarro, there is a condition of approval that no tournaments or competitions may be held. Why is that? 
That was a condition um, actually in the conditional use permit approved in 2007. And I, I have to defer to planning manager to see why is that. Yeah, uh, Chair Roman, Commissioner Cookton, I would guess that would have been a product of a parking concern at the time. Um, parking was probably analyzed and they were probably very close to or at their uh, requirement. And so the concern would have been having a tournament would add parking demand potentially. Okay, thank you. Other questions for staff? Uh, is the applicant uh, online, or I don't see them in person? Yeah, he. Uh, which is the name? Jeff. Jeff. There. Jeff. Okay, uh, Mr. Sidner, I will unmute you now. Good evening. Hello. Uh, thank you for having me. Would you like to speak at all on this item? Um, I, I've been listening, and um, I, I don't think that I have anything to add. It all sounds very accurate. Uh, as mentioned, we've been there since 2005, and to my knowledge, we haven't had any complaints or incidences, and uh, simply relocating within the same mall. Um, as far as uh, holding any tournaments or large events, we don't. We're, we're part of a, a large organization in the, in the Midwest, and any, any big large events that we hold are typically held at large event centers. Nothing would ever be held at one of the locations, so that, that shouldn't ever be uh, a concern. Um, uh, beyond that, uh, thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Any questions for the applicant? Seeing none. This item is a public hearing, so I will open the public hearing. Uh, there is nobody in the chamber who is not staff, and uh, do we have anyone online? Chair Roman, uh, we have one person online who is not staff, so we will check in uh, with that person. Steve, I will unmute you now. Good evening. Did you no want to speak on item number two? Steve's help. Hello, is that someone by the name of Steve? Did you want to speak on item number two? I have no comment. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, that is everyone online and in person. Seeing no other individuals, I would entertain a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. So moved. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to close the public hearing. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Any discussion on this item? Commissioner Cookton. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Seems like a very straightforward application and a good one at that. Happy to see a, a business to, deciding to stay in Bloomington, and uh, I'm in support. Commissioner Albrecht. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I can echo what Commissioner Cookton said. I'm in support. It seems fairly straightforward. I do appreciate that the condition um, regarding the space and number specifically is eliminated. Um, not saying that the business is going to move, but would have created a an easier process probably for this <laughs> business just to move spaces. I agree with you on that and, and undo burden in the future. Uh, other discussion? Commissioner McGovern. Thank you, Chair. Um, I approve this as well. Um, as I have children attend the karate school and for them to um, expand and continue to be part of the Bloomington uh, group is fantastic. I approve. Um, anyone else wish to speak or entertain a motion? Commissioner Albrecht? In case PL2022-180, having been able to make the required findings, I move to approve a conditional use permit for a karate school in an existing shopping center at 5101 West 90th Street, subject to the conditions and code requirements attached to the staff report. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to, uh, excuse me, approve a conditional use permit at the subject property. Any further discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion passes. This is a final decision by the commission unless an appeal is received by 4.30 p.m. on October 18th. Uh, the chair's prerogative, I am going to reorder the agenda in the interest of, um, we have a quorum, although we're moving to study items, which does not require a quorum. Um, but knowing that some of the commitments that commissioners have, I'm going to move us to item number four. 
and we will do item number four, number five, and then we'll return to item number three. So at this time, I would um, ask Planner Rickbile to uh, give us the presentation on cottage home standards, and I see uh, senior Planner Johnson is with us. Yeah, thank you, Chair and uh, members of the commission. Good to see you again. It's been a little while. Um, so we, while these were, while these two items are broken out as separate in your agenda, uh, they kind of touch on a similar topic and theme that we want to talk about. So we thought it would be prudent to kind of combine the uh, presentation and make it into one uh, flowing thing, hopefully. Thank you, Mallory. Um, okay, looks good. So uh, the topic, um, the two subtopics are cottage home development, um, which is a, a development, a residential development type that kind of goes by different names, uh, and then a request from the city council that was added to the 2022 uh, work plan uh, to review the city's townhome standards. Um, one of the hot topics in uh, planning and housing recently has been the subject of uh, middle housing or missing middle housing, uh, as some people call it. Um, so both of these development types uh, meet that uh, kind of loose and uh, new definition. And so that's why we thought it would be good to kind of uh, group these things together. So when you think about the spectrum of housing, certainly uh, kind of going along down the line here on the slide, you have single family, um, uh, which is the pre predominant housing type in Bloomington, um, uh, kind of going uh, left to right across the screen there and uh, kind of different housing types, ADUs, uh, two family dwellings. Uh, there in the bottom left is a cottage home uh, development. Townhomes certainly have a lot of townhomes in Bloomington, and then multifamily housing. And uh, one of the reasons that this has become uh, a hot topic, there's a few reasons for that. Um, in Bloomington, in the last five years, uh, 1,441 uh, net residential units have been added. Um, we don't have the full data for 22, uh, of course, yet. Um, but of that amount of residential dwellings that have been added, 98% of those are multiple family uh, dwellings in Bloomington. So overwhelmingly uh, all multifamily. And we're a fully built out community, uh, so certainly that makes sense. Um, the city has also prioritized uh, the uh, creation and preservation of affordable housing. Um, and a lot of the development that occurs in that arena uh, does occur in multifamily uh, residential development. Um, that has uh, triggered or um, caused some discussion at the city council level about uh, ways to augment or to support uh, means to create affordable home ownership uh, opportunities, which is really difficult in multiple family scenarios. Um, I'm not an expert on this uh, statute or the, the state law that uh, has kind of created this conundrum, but right now there's some uh, challenge or uh, complexity to the state's condo laws which was really stunted the development and growth of condos in Minnesota since the passing of that law. So unless something along those lines were to change, uh, it, it uh, results in multifamily not being a really uh, good path to get affordable ownership uh, in that setting. Um, as far as other elements that are relevant to this discussion, the city's housing element in the comprehensive plan, uh, it calls for a range and variety of housing choices. It also talks about reducing barriers uh, regulatory barriers for the creation of non-traditional housing types, specifically ADUs, two-family dwellings, uh, those types of uh, housing. And then uh, certainly uh, the comp plan strongly emphasizes creating and preserving uh, affordable housing. Um, yeah, I think that's the main things I want to touch on there. So uh, one thing that is going to be coming down the pipeline to you later, it's not uh, meant to be a focus of tonight's discussion, uh, it, but it actually relates to multiple projects that are going on. It certainly relates to what we're going to be discussing here tonight, but it also relates to the single family and two family uh, residential zoning update project, which will be coming before you at a public hearing uh, type setting either later in November or in December. Uh, so not, not far away. Um, one of the issues that we've encountered is that uh, the city's uh, um, future uh, uh, planned land use categories, uh, specifically the residential categories, as you see on your screen, currently we have three categories set up in our comp plan, low, medium, and high density residential. Uh, the density ranges of those categories are zero to five uh, units, five to 10 units an acre, and then 10 to 150 units an acre. Uh, one thing that we've uh, kind of been encountering as we've been talking more about 80 uh, accessory dwelling units, been talking more about two family dwellings, uh, is that in a lot of low density residential areas, if you were to add an ADU uh, or a two family dwelling, 
uh, even meeting some of the minimum standards in our zoning code, you're actually exceeding five units uh, per acre, um, so which is not consistent with the low density residential land use category. Um, and then when you get when you move that discussion further of uh, potentially examining the two-family dwelling standards, potentially looking at cottage homes, uh, looking at ADUs on uh, smaller lots, uh, it really does beg uh, a discussion about uh, whether these density ranges within these categories uh, is really workable uh, for the goals that the city, uh, the planning commission, and city council have established in these um, uh, in the zoning code and in the comprehensive plan. So um, hopefully on a parallel track, um, uh, but at worst case scenario, not far after, we're likely gonna be bringing a uh, comprehensive plan text amendment to examine this specific issue. We have had a preliminary meeting with Met Council and based on our uh, early meeting with them, they are supportive of this approach. Um, one of the things to note about this is that because Bloomington is a fully built out community, even tinkering with some of these density ranges doesn't really result in a very large increase in our uh, overall population projections or housing projections. Um, you're really talking about redevelopment and infill uh, type projects. Um, so I don't want to mention any specific numbers today because it's something that it's still very uh, uh, draft is being generous <laughs> at where it's at right now. Uh, but it's something that uh, does relate to tonight's discussion and will relate to uh, the upcoming single family and two family zoning project. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to Mallory. She's going to talk about cottage homes, and then I will come back for townhomes. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Planner Johnson. Okay, so um, cottage home developments um, are basically they are smaller detached housing structures, sometimes arranged or oriented around a shared courtyard. Um, and what makes this missing middle housing style unique is that there's a lot of variability in this housing type. So you can have um, cottage home developments that have larger um, homes, or you could have them be more compact and to be smaller. So there are, um, they are also called cluster communities or cottage court communities in other um, cities. Um, for the purposes of this presentation moving forward, we, um, we prefer the term cottage home developments. Oh, is it? Okay, great, thank you. Um, so I have some photos of some cottage home developments. They are from out west, hence the Mediterranean sort of facade that is provided, but um, we do have them in Minnesota. Um, this is the, uh, we, um, we've spoken with planners from each of the communities shown on the screen um, about the standards that they apply to cottage home developments, as well as the status of projects and, um, and if this has, has come to fruition. Um, Richfield, who um, has had a policy for around 10 years, has yet to develop a cottage home development. Um, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth um, have had a few um, developments that are um, the cottage, cottage home, or in the form of the cottage home development. Um, it is also worth noting that St. Paul, Duluth, and Minneapolis are also cities that adhere to form-based code, and so they do have some provisions as it relates to their performance standards um, setbacks um, that if a uh, if there is, uh, where there is strict adherence is impractical, there is some flexibility that is built in that allows the proposed alternative, um, is proposed, if the proposed alternative meets the intent. Um, Richfield um, prescribes to the more traditional or Euclidean tony, um, zoning um, uh, philosophy, and so um, those are much more or less, less um, flexible. On. Okay, so um, the, the big takeaway points, and, and there are other um, slides moving forward that go into some of these in more greater detail, um, but the um, across the board, the approval processes are conditional use um, with uh, a subject to appeal or subject to revocation. 
Um, and then uh, there is some variability. Every city does kind of a different thing in terms of the utilities requirement for cottage home development. And um, net density is um, the only community of the four that are um, shown to you right now are beholden to the guided density of the comprehensive plan. Um, and then Richfield is the only community that requires owner occupancy for cottage home developments. So these are some of the big questions that we are seeking feedback this evening. Um, and, the, and, and what we'll do is I'll kind of go through and provide those slides and then um, you can give us feedback on what you would like to see, if indeed you would like to see a policy framework for cottage home developments. Um, but things that we would like to uh, spur discussion is um, what zoning districts should cottage homes be permitted? Um, what approval process should be used? Uh, what is the direction in terms of medium lot size? Um, what is the direction that is preferred for maximum number of units? what direction is preferred for parking requirements, um, proximity to arterial or collector roads, and what direction is preferred for owner occupancy. So I have the map of the zoning districts. Um, we, could, we could go uh, in the way of, um, if it is approved uh, to have cottage home developments in R1 and RS, zoning districts, and that is, uh, the RS1 is the yellow um, spots on the map, and then the, the um, part without any fill is the R1, or the R3 or RM12, which is the um, combined with some other um, RM zoning districts, and R4 is the sort of beige color that you're seeing. Um, then another big question is what approval process should be used? Um, there is, of course, um, going from sort of the one that allows the most discretion to the least, starts with um, rezoning. This is the most discretion possible. Um, it is both costly, or it is the most costly and lengthy option. And then there's conditional. Um, this process includes a public hearing, a required notification of neighboring residents, uh, the conditional use permit could be approved by either the Planning Commission, subject to appeal, or City Council, and it offers less discretion than the rezoning, but more discretion than the permitted approach. And then the permitted approach um, could be reviewed administratively. Um, it does represent the least cost and the most timely process. Um, there is no public hearing requirement, but um, there is a provision that we could um, subject um, any developments that are within a 500 foot buffer from a planned or existing cottage home development to be reviewed. So that's always possible. Um, in terms of direction for minimum lot size, it's worth noting that right now, um, it might be advantageous to model a policy from the framework of how the discussions on standards for single family and two family um, residential dwellings um, will be um, how those conversations evolve in the next few months. Um, and as planner Johnson said earlier, the current guy plan density for low density residential is five units an acre. Um, I've on this slide I've, slide, I've provided sort of the breakdown of requirements for um, how residential areas in Bloomington um, and then calculated the density. And then I've also provided the comparative um, numbers for Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, and Richfield. Um, in terms of cottage home developments, one of the big questions is you know, how do we how do we determine the maximum number of units? Um, we could do it a, a, a way that we say every unit has to have at least three thousand square foot per dwelling, um, or we could say five single or five a maximum of five in single family zones, no limit in other zones, or we could do a combination of the two. Um, for example, 3,000 um, per dwelling unit, not to exceed five in single family zones. Um, the staff recommendation um, is that the combination of two strategies would probably be the most appropriate for Bloomington. 
Um, again, uh, this is for parking requirements. Um, these may be evolving within the uh, for single and two family homes in the next three months. Um, but I do provide some different examples to look at in terms of uh, our comparative communities and then how this plays out in Bloomington. In terms of proximity to arterial or collector roads, um, land uses really aren't tied to their proximity to arterial or collector roads. Um, and at this point, no other communities do have a standard that would uh, re relegate a cottage home development to any area connected to an arterial or collector street. In terms of owner occupancy requirements, um, right now, uh, the um, only, uh, Richfield is the only community that requires them for cottage how, or cottage home developments, um, and we do require an occupancy for ADU. Um, the staff position right now is to not require for cottage home developments, um, but then that's something that we're getting feedback from you all as well. Um, and then there's limiting factors that exist within our code that might constrain the number of developments or the size of developments as they exist in Bloomington. Um, one of those main things is the impervious surface um, at 35%. Although uh, right now the two family homes may exceed 35% uh, and go to 45% with the condition that some of the surface water management or that they have a surface water management plan um, we do envision that if cottage homes, if they were allowed, might match a similar, something similar to the two family standards. And then the setback requirements are similar in that regard. So two family houses, I believe, have a 50 foot setback, and so that might limit the size. Um, but if these happen to change, we might expect that cottage home developments would sort of adhere to what we envision for two family dwellings. So then that brings the question, um, should the planning, oops, sorry, I'm getting some feedback. Um, should the planning division pursue cottage home development policy as part of our 2023 work plan? And I think that's, and then I have one, one more slide, but that's based on what you all, your discussion. Thank you for that. Um, since this is a study item, uh, I think we can be, uh, we a little more informal in our conversation. So I think if, if the works for the commission, maybe we'll go back and work our way through um, some of the slides that you had, we're looking for feedback on and maybe we'll just work through those um, little by little. I have a question. I have a question. Uh, Nick, you mentioned the condo at the issues with condo development and the, I you know there's a 10 year construction guarantee or whatever it is. Is that also a guarantee for cottage home development? Is that gonna, I mean, are we up against that as well with? Yeah, Chair Roman, I wish I'll I'm not aware of that requirement applying to cottage homes, no. Okay. And I wouldn't anticipate that. Okay. Yeah. So, um, for, yeah, for, I mean, just a, for those, uh, Commissioner Albrecht's probably more aware of kind of what that situation is, but real briefly, um, it's my understanding that they, the guarantee is that the developer is on the hook for a certain period of time uh, to maintain the property or any catastrophic uh, structural failures, uh, which makes financing those projects challenging, so. Yeah, in other communities, it's like between three and five years, and Minnesota has a 10-year guarantee, yeah. so it makes it very difficult to finance. So um, why don't we just go ahead and just click through slide by slide, and again, let's feel free to just jump in and we can have a few formalities there. Um, thoughts on the uh, zoning question? I, I guess I'm just not sure why this would be any different than how we view townhomes <laughs> and this townhome standards. Feels like that is a good similarity. Um, and enough so that if it works for townhomes, it should work for cottage homes. Um, but I know we're kind of it's, we're kind of doing both at the same time. So 
Is the, are these also considered to be changes for the townhome development standards? Can I take? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Chair Roman, Commissioner Albrecht. So, um, yeah, I, I think in, a, in staff discussion and maybe uh, one thing that um, can maybe add some uh, context to the discussion too is that even if you had one dwelling on a lot and say you just wanted to add one more dwelling, that would be a cottage home development. So you could be talking about as little as two, any, any just adding one additional detached dwelling. So in that respect, it's very similar to an ADU standards, but then that structure would not be uh, subject to the ADU standards in terms of proportionality, uh, maximum dwelling size, some of those other requirements that are in the ADU uh, provision. Um, you could have more than two. You could have, I mean, certainly it'll be at the discretion of the Planning Commission and Council in terms of establishing what those limits are. And as Mallory mentioned, there are other limitations with respect to setbacks and uh, impervious surface. I say that as a way to say that is this use closer to townhomes or is it actually closer to two-family dwellings? I think on more of our internal discussions, we view this use as closer to two-family dwellings than we do townhomes. Uh, townhomes, particularly in Bloomington, and we'll talk about that next, uh, but most townhome developments have many units. Um, they have as many as the, you know, the non-conforming ones. There's some buildings that have 10 or more uh, units in a single attached structure. Um, some of them, uh, the code standard now is a maximum of six. Um, but these are detached uh, from one another. Um, they are distinct dwellings in that way. They don't have shared common walls or those types of things. And so when I think about it that way, I think about, okay, townhomes, and we'll talk about that process next, but that's a reguiding and rezoning process, highly discretionary. Um, two family is all the way at the other end of that spectrum right now, except when in a grouping. Um, but it's a permitted use in R1. So, um, you know, what district should it be uh, allowed in? If you think it's more similar to two-family dwelling, then maybe it should be allowed in R1. Uh, if you think it's more similar to townhomes, um, then likely then it would result in considering a zoning district more similar to that's appropriate for townhomes. So it's kind of a, it's kind of how you view it kind of thing. And I think it, it's, it's going to depend on what performance standards you establish that kind of set the development potential, uh, frankly. Yeah, I think it gets to the question about and it bleed, or bleeding in a little bit to the other some of your other questions, but um, whether we it be what level of discretion we have in the or we we recommend and as you bring it back, um, you know I, I think it, where the location is for me depends on uh, how big is the development, right? So let's say that someone wants to scrape my house. Um, I think it's a third of an acre lot, or it's not a not a big lot, um, and let's say you go at. 45%, so you can probably put two on there. Um, two on one lot, probably not a big thing. Someone comes in and buys my entire cul-de-sac, scrapes the whole thing, and they want to put in a cottage development with 12. Is that different? I mean, we feel differently about that. Um, and so uh, that just, that's just what I'm thinking out loud is as I look at, you know, what would we – recommend for a, where it's similar to two family and where it becomes more similar to multifamily. Those are the things I think about, which then gets into your proximity question, which then um, could get into a replatting and rezoning and all those things. So In Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Duluth, the examples of cottage homes, are they adding an additional unit on site like you mentioned, or is it the images that you showed where it was sort of the development and all of them were developed at the same time and they were more of a Go ahead. like townhouse deal. Yeah, um, uh, Chair Roman, Commissioner Albrecht, <laughs> that's the first time I got it right. <laughs> um, so yeah, there, it varies. So Duluth, um, they have more, they had I think two uh, cottage home developments that um, were all built at the same time. And so I think, I think there were um, at least five units um, in those, whereas the case studies we looked for Minneapolis, it was uh, three, or it was, a, it was a, a duplex that added another um, primary, or um, dwelling. Yeah, back. another dwelling unit. And so they had to go through the cottage home development standards in order to um, make their their project possible. Um, I'm drawing a blank for, I believe uh, St. Paul had. Uh, it was a two unit, yeah. 
had a two unit cottage dwelling. I mean, I, I think in those communities that the reason why the Duluth one was a little bit odd, and I think it actually had like 10 dwellings on the one development oh, that really? they sent us. Yeah, we, we met with uh, the staff of these different communities and they would talk about, uh, you know, four or five developments that they worked on, but they would send us the plans for maybe one or two of them. So we didn't get, uh, it's hard to get the full flavor of all the things that they're looking at. But the, what I took away from the conversations is that in the Minneapolis and St. Paul context, it's mostly adding one more dwelling to an existing single family lot. Uh, and they're using that process to do that. The Duluth situation was a little bit of an oddball in that it was actually kind of a green, not, uh, it was a part of town that was not uh, previously developed in a Seward area. So it was like a very kind of, it's not rural, uh, like you'd think of a rural area, but it was a part of Duluth that had very large lots and they were transitioning these large lot areas to a small cottage park uh, or cottage home development rather. So that was a little bit of an oddball. But you know, Bloomington's more, built out, we don't have uh, large undeveloped uh, areas of land that are uh, scheduled for uh, single family development. I can only think of one on the east end of 98th Street, um, uh, kind of on the river that's, a, you know, where you can actually get more than five lots. And to the, the point about, you know, grouping them together, I think that's why uh, that standard was uh, developed and adopted for the two family dwellings in order, in order to require an approval process for groupings is what they call it. Um, and those standards. So um, that could kind of theoretically uh, preclude that uh, kind of development scenario that you mentioned uh, from happening if it required some kind of higher level uh, or higher, more discretionary decision than just a permitted or even a conditional use permit. One thing I will say about that to me that uh, um, uh, about the Minneapolis and St. Paul and Duluth examples where I think they probably have more aggressive uh, policies in their single family, certainly than what we have here now today, uh, they still all do require a conditional use permit process uh, so, uh, that has to be approved by planning commission. So something Remind to note me, there. These, these cottage homes are, in what we're discussing, are, are we're discussing fully independent freestanding homes. We, I remember when we met with the HRA, there was, we talked about all types of housing and there were some that were small homes, but then there was like a, a community house that yep. so you didn't have all the things in your home that you would need to be completely uh, self-sufficient we're talking about cottage homes that are completely self-sufficient correct that's correct and Mallory if I can speak to that because that was part of kind of the city council after it went to your study session it went to city council study session and they had questions about that and the direction that they had is of the land use that they were more interested in was the, the fully self-sufficient dwelling units that had the cooking, uh, sanitary, and uh, sleeping facilities on one unit. Um, uh, we did do research about that other use type, so we do have some information to share about that, but it's just not where we uh, thought the yeah, focus was. It's not a problem. I just wanted to clarify for yeah. myself and for those who might be following. Yep. One thing we didn't mention, too, uh, in the presentation, and maybe we touched on a little bit in ADUs, but uh, uh, construction along these lines with modular construction is going to change the game on some of these things. So like related to townhomes too, uh, you know, land prices is one thing that's just going to continue to remain a challenge. Uh, but if there's uh, new methods of construction and new, new types of uh, materials uh, that make uh, these types of uh, dwellings more affordable to approach, you might see kind of a changing landscape even within these low density areas a little bit. And we think we'll see that with ADUs. It just hasn't caught on yet. And not only that, but there's not like a really as well established developer set for this type of development. Uh, you know, you have some small actors or uh, kind of lower um, volume actors in that market, um, but it's just not a big thing because the um, it's just not as profitable. Other feedback on zoning? Do you have any sort of map that indicates how many parcels would allow cottage homes if we did option one versus option two? It would be significant, um, significant difference. We haven't done, without establishing what a minimum lot size will right. be, and part of our challenge is that some of that discussion is gonna build off of whatever gets adopted for the single and two family zoning, so it's a little bit putting the cart before the horse. Um, and that's why, I don't know if we got to the last slide, but it's, it's likely something that we have to uh, work on next year. Mm -hmm. So the question before you tonight is, is this something that we should put on our work plan, frankly? Um, and that, that way we can do more of that uh, kind of uh, higher or that uh, deeper level or more detailed analysis where we can actually look at different lot areas and 
kind of development potential type analysis. I guess I don't have a particular opinion because I I would just be curious if we're if we're choosing one over the other, are we just excluding the entire city by choosing one over the other? Uh, and at my in my hunch, I don't know if that's necessarily true, is we may the requirements may be such that if we decide we're we decide on a certain zoning district and then we put all these requirements in place, then there's nowhere that this can be developed. And I just don't want to be in the position where that happens. It's similar to the um, public storage uh, facilities, which really, um, I mean, it's impossible. So I don't want to get us into a place where we want, if, if the goal is, if the end goal is middle housing, missing middle housing, and we're working backwards from that, then I think we have to be flexible and figure out, well, where would these things go and how would they actually get developed? And is there anything that we can do to kind of incentivize or at least make the door slightly ajar? Um, because this isn't something that's been done or has been, has taken on in really a, in any community with, sub, you know, substantially. Yeah, Chair Commissioner Albrecht, one thing I'll say too is that all of the whole list of things that Mallory has presented to you and is going to discuss, they all uh, have levers one way or the other that are going to make it more difficult to do this development or less difficult to do this development in balancing act with the value that that regulation uh, provides you in order to maintain uh, semblance of strong neighborhoods, low density areas, you know, neighborhood continuity, uh, make the development uh, fit in and uh, be appropriate with uh, kind of the existing context. So, you know, it's you're pushing and pulling those two things, and um, that's kind of the constant balancing act. I so. guess I would, I would be in favor of starting your investigation broadly and then looking at what the performance standards might be that keep them from being too concentrated or similar to what the, as you said, similar to how you think about two-family. Uh, that's where I would start from, I guess, and see what what your your work produces. Okay, I want to go on to the next one. Sorry about that audio issue earlier. I don't know what happened. Oh, good. There. Was, um, on, so on this one, I um, I lean toward the permitted use with whatever performance standards we have. That again. To, to uh, if, if we're going to allow it in more places, I think we want to avoid it becoming concentrated or being too inconsistent with whatever is around. Um, but I, I'm less interested in public hearings where someone doesn't want it <laughs> next door uh, because they're worried that it doesn't fit in. Uh, that's my take. I, I agree with that, and I think it's important to allow the public to say their piece on what they what they want or don't want in their neighborhood so my as long as the conditions are met right um it seems like it would be appropriate to have it be a conditional use though again are we planning ourselves out of more than less so i, I kind of go back and forth <laughs> that was not an answer sorry <laughs> information nonetheless um, I lean towards a conditional use permit. Um, I hear your concern about we're going to have a lot of meetings with residents that get anxious, but um, I think the one thing I've noticed in my time on the commission is that the things people care about most are what happens next to their house. We can put up as big of an office tower or a hotel as we want and nobody comes, but when something comes next to their home or down the street, they care. And so I think... The public would not be happy with us if we didn't give them an opportunity to speak of next to something that's going to change their neighborhood. So I'm in favor of a conditional use permit. I will piggyback on that. I would be in favor of a conditional use permit. Okay. All right. Um, lot size question. So Chair Roman, if I may, this this is another this this and the parking yes. one are yep. ones that are going to be In highly informed by whatever happens yep. next with single and two family. So I I don't say that to yeah. discourage your discussion. It's just that I think that those are going to set important data points and benchmarks mm -hmm. um, for this use. 
Um, so just that that point. Yeah, and I think that to your point about, um, it goes back to where we end up in the first question about what districts do we allow it in. Um, but I think I, I'm, I'm intrigued by the idea of a per unit measure as well. Yeah, I agree. Per unit measure. Um, it's it's interesting. I the difference between the single family and two family homes. It feels like it to me. It feels like it's in between those, but it's also in between the two family and townhome residential. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. <laughs> Yeah, that's a tricky place to be in. So it feels like if it's just adding one unit to a single family lot, it's kind of in between the duplex and single family. But if you're adding two, then I'm like, oh, it's closer to a townhome, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Chair, on, on some of these where it's very analytical, I don't have a background in planning. And I've never lived in a single family neighborhood, or at least I've never owned a unit in a single family neighborhood. So I just, I don't feel like I can provide constructive feedback on this. That's okay. This is, this is a brainstorming session. So our brains will storm in different places. All right. Um, one. Next one. I guess that's similar there we talked about. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering mm -hmm. about the combination. I don't really understand that. Um, so, and correct me if I'm wrong, so it would be if you had um, five in an, in an area of single family, you couldn't have another cottage dwelling, right? Um, uh, Chair Commissioner, um, the way that I interpret this is that uh, within one development. So within if you have a um, 15,000 square foot lot, then we would say that you could have five, you could have, you would need at least 3,000 square feet per unit. So that would limit you to five. Or we can do a numeric um, cap at saying no more than five or no more than four, no more than six. Mm -hmm. um, and we can also relegate that to whatever zone it's in. or And we could do a combination of, of the two. Yeah, Chair Commissioner Alder, if I can add to that too. We, we have some, uh, particularly along the river, but we have some R1 lots that are actually quite sizable. Um, and so that's what kind of leads us down a path of thinking that a combination approach makes the most amount of sense. And to your concern about, well, this, isn't more, of, this is more akin to a townhome uh, development, uh, that's where a hard cap Mm -hmm. uh, per a single family uh, lot would uh, kind of preclude that outcome, for lack of a better term. You know, we have some lots down in the bluff that are 25, 30, you know, thousand square feet or even more in some cases. So and it also raises the question of it, 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 it's mentioned in the in the two family. But I think in the in the in the duplex, or the two family, we have a we have a and not another one within a certain distance, right? Is it 500? 500. So, I mean, there may be something like that that's a standard as well. Like, you could put five of them on a lot, but you couldn't have another cluster of five within a certain distance if, if we were concerned about concentrating too many in one area. That's how I, that's how I was reading this, was clus not clustering them. And I was going to say, I don't think it, that's a bad idea to actually cluster them I think only because I'm thinking about available lots and where that would be and it would be along the river and in the larger lots and I wouldn't want to say like well no your neighbor put another so you can't add you know you can't yeah. add one well it's a, it's you're creating another type of community and so right not not allowing others with the same in the same circumstances you are with a type of home and and the, the type of, of home we're trying to provide limiting that you know could be an issue as well. Yeah. Five seems like a lot. I think five would be a, a hard pill to swallow for 
some members of the community. Because that's about that's that would be uh, if you're thinking about three thousand square foot per dwelling. That's a, that's five on a third of an acre, right? That's that's, that's a lot. That's a lot. Yeah, and and I would just add, Chair and Commissioner, that the the three thousand number is not that's. That's no, a, again, that's it, a it, it's thing too. Gotta have something just, to react to. Yep, and, and right. We're giving you a little, yep, little reaction. We're supposed to, we're, <laughs> I was just like, whoa. Our brains are storming. That's great. I loved that. That was awesome. All right, next one. We have parking. So, Chair Roman, this is one again. Um, maybe it makes more sense to revisit this yep. next next year if you decide to yep. put it on the work plan. Good call. And I had noticed when you had the pictures at the beginning of the different types of housing, half of those only had one enclosed parking in the picture. So I, I'm, I'm not that devious. Good job <laughs> foreshadowing. <laughs> Proof. <laughs> um, arterial collector roads, opinions on that? No. Yeah, so a little bit of background. Our two family dwellings aren't required to have certain proximity uh, to arterial collector roads, uh, ADUs aren't. Um, town hall, what I think what Mallory was, stri was stri striving at with the land use comment is that our zoning districts are tied uh, to having access to collector arterials once you give uh, to a certain level of density. So like RM12, for example, calls for access to arterial and collectors, um, but R3 does not. So uh, we don't have uh, again, if you're thinking about this more in the mode of a two-family dwelling uh, or even a small townhome development, frankly, because our three does not require that, then we don't think this would necessarily be appropriate for this land use. But we didn't want to just bypass it without your... The way I think about these standards of being on a certain type of road is it's either you're on it or you're not, because I don't think it's a matter of traffic. You know, five little houses isn't going to do anything to traffic. It's a matter of neighborhood feel. You're on a busy street. This is less impactful. It's already busy. There's already traffic. You already hear stuff. If you're on a really quiet street, this becomes much more impactful. So I think if you're, like, to me, that's how I view whether you're on a busy street or not is are you changing the neighborhood feel? And so, yeah, to me, it, proximity to a road is kind of irrelevant to me. Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah. I think I got the nod. Keep moving. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. <clears throat> yeah, I don't think you need. I don't think it needs to be owner occupied. Yeah. I think that if we're really trying to, f I mean, if if ninety eight percent of development has been in the multifamily space, those folks are renting, um, and I think. You know, having the ability to rent a different type of housing other than just a multifamily unit is beneficial. I mean, there are tons of duplexes in South Minneapolis. I lived in one for a substantial period of time and loved that versus living in a multifamily environment. So, um, you know, I don't think it necessary. I don't think it should be required. Thanks for saying that because when I was reading this last night or whatever the other night I was trying to think of well if they're not owner occupied why not just apartments because you're getting more units per acre significantly more so why do this from a city perspective it seems like well I'd rather just have apartments there because we get more density but thank you for your point that from a owner or from an occupant perspective it might be better because it's a different housing choice that maybe someone doesn't want to live in an apartment so thank you for that yeah I mean we moved into one we moved into one because I want we wanted a dog and it was just much easier to be able to just walk outside versus take an elevator with the dog down and, you know, it's just an option. Thank you. Yeah, I, I agree. I don't think owner-occupied is necessary. I think there's, there's pros and cons that come with that if you're the renter. <laughs> um, and I've known, I've, I've known and visited people who've lived in both situations in duplexes where the owner lived on the other side of the wall and the owner didn't, and I think... As a as a renter, I would not, and I don't know that I would like that. <laughs> All right. Okay. Oh. Oh. 
Actually, I wanted to go back to your other one because it, it's something that I've thought of before. Um, you know, we all are well aware of the, the issues with stormwater and with runoff and with increasing rainfall. Um, we also know that there are different challenges that come with density or trying to achieve density in whatever form that is, whether it's some of our bigger projects that have you know, millions of dollars in, in managed stormwater on site or some of these residential items where it's incremental density, right? We're not, we're not massively increasing the density, but maybe you're putting two of these cottage homes on what was a single family. Um, and so I wonder if we think about, and this is not necessarily something we need an answer to anytime soon, but I know when I lived in Minneapolis, lots were categorized based on your impervious surface and you uh, incurred a different stormwater fee based on how much your, your lot generated. So realizing that there may be situations where we might have to come up with other ways to deal with the issue of impervious surface other than just trying to ma maintain as much grass as we can. So it's just a more a thought. It's not necessarily something I need to feedback on, but it, it, they're, they're things that can be in tension. Yeah, Chair Roman, if I can add, I, I, I can't recall if Mallory mentioned this or not, so forgive me if I'm repeating something she already said, but um, the issue that we face related to this question is that the storm sewers, as reported by our engineering division, just are not sized uh, on the same level or uh, diameter as some yep. uh, infrastructure in other communities. So when they're allowing for uh, more impervious to be allowed in two family dwellings, for an example, with on-site stormwater management features, um, the thought process there is that it's, it's not gonna add added capacity to our storm sewers. Yep. So um, even if they take on that approach for cottage homes or even for single family homes uh, more writ largely, it'll still remain a, a limiting factor, but a financial one, because these these stormwater features are not cheap to install uh, either. No. So. Perhaps we could install those under sidewalks as we add sidewalks. <laughs> I'm trying. Sure. <laughs> All right, so your question about should this be on your list for next year, I, I would be in favor of it if, if you have time. I don't know what others feel. Of course, we haven't discussed the work plan at large, have we? You will, you will get another crack at that. I think it's just, it's part of the bigger picture of adi adding additional units and housing to the city of Bloomington. So I think it's important. I think it's a goal from the, from city council perspective, I know that was a goal. Mm -hmm. So I think it fits within the work plan. Chair Roman, if I may add one thing to that yeah. consideration too, is that uh, I believe uh, Planning Manager Markegaard gave you an update about the reorganization of the port and the HRA. Yep. So under that reorganization, uh, they, and Glenn can correct me if I'm wrong, but the HRA's new uh, uh, challenge or new mission, for lack of a better term, has to do with development less than 20 units in a single development, and their mission is specifically focused on missing middle. Mm -hmm. um, and so giving them more tools uh, to how to kind of achieve that vision or achieve that mission, I think uh, will be valuable uh, to them being successful in achieving that. Anything else you need from us on this one before you? I don't think so. Okay. You want to stick around or you want to follow up before we go on to the next one? I don't know what the timing is. No, you can, you, you can do it. It's up to you. I won't be offended if. <laughs> well, right. Never mind. No, um, it's okay. Uh, you can go ahead and go move on okay. into the townhomes. Is yeah, I think this one will be a little bit faster because I think it's more of a, I see it more as a reporting back, um, kind, of, kind of an update. We don't talk about townhomes a lot, uh, mainly because, uh, again, we're built out city and a lot of them were developed in the 70s and 80s. Um, uh, so just doing a review uh, about our townhome standards. So all townhomes come in many different uh, forms and fashions. We have three unit buildings. We have, uh, as I said, some buildings have more than 10 units. And current standards that were developed and adopted in the uh, more recent time, in 2015, uh, cap the number of units in a single structure at six. Um, but part of the discussion, too, this might seem odd for me to bring up, but just what is a townhome? Uh, and the reason I mention that is that in a lot of the data collection we did and working with our assessing division and different uh, residential uh, structures are coded differently in our assessing system, um, it, you would think that it would just be simple to just kind of punch in townhome into our either our, our uh, land use uh, data systems or our uh, assessing data systems and it, it kind of 
gives us spits out some different results. So I'm putting a little bit of a disclaimer or caveat that some of the data uh, might just uh, slightly err in one small direction or the other, and not in a large direction, just small. Um, but yeah, so in terms of what is a townhome now in our zoning code, it has to do with developments that are more than uh, three units or more, uh, and they're configured in side-by-side -side fashion, not stacked vertically. That is more of a multifamily uh, residential use. Uh, and then also just kind of think about kind of individual uh, access or uh, doors, typically. It's not a shared common corridor, um, uh, typically. So think about that, too. Um, there are... Let me look at my number here. I think it's 2,000. Uh, with my disclaimer caveat aside, I think there's there's 2,266 townhome units, uh, according to access, uh, excuse me, assessing data. They are geographically uh, dispersed throughout the community, although I would say the concentration favors a little bit uh, more to the west uh, part of the community. Um, and uh, the reason uh, for that really has uh, mostly to do just with the era that they were developed in. Uh, that was the portion of the community that had more available and vacant land at that time. Um, kind of getting to the next slide here, this just kind of helps more tell the historic tale. Um, you know, very few townhome uh, units were developed in the 1960s and then it just uh, exploded, boomed in the 1970s. Uh, also strong production in the 80s and then started to tail down uh, 90s, 2000s and 2010s. Um, there's been very little townhome development uh, in recent years. The last project that was actually approved and being constructed was Bluffs and Sands Pier at the south end of Lindale Avenue. If you're familiar with that development, they have a few three-unit um, uh, buildings. Uh, you are familiar with the townhome development that was approved at Penn and 86th Street. That has not yet uh, moved forward into construction. Um, uh, so that project does remain approved, but is not, uh, um, uh, not uh, dug in the ground yet. One point about townhomes uh, in terms of their importance to achieving some of the city's uh, goals of our housing element, our comprehensive plan, and just more generally, uh, is that townhomes uh, allow for uh, a robust opportunity for affordable home ownership. So if you look at this table here, this is based on affordability levels that are set by the Met Council. It's a regional uh, data point that has to do with housing costs in the metro. Uh, they set what uh, family incomes are uh, according to uh, the median family income in the metro, and then they translate that to an affordable home price uh, using, using a calculation depending on some factors. Um, and so what that tells us is that 79% of our townhome dwellings are affordable to a family at 80% AMI. Over 50%, uh, 57% are affordable at 60% AMI. Um, uh, 11 of percent, so to almost 250 dwellings are at the 50% AMI level and 17 of those dwellings are affordable at the 30%. I talked to um, Environmental Health, they handle the rental housing program at the city, and they asked, this is, this is not gospel, but they estimated to me that they thought that um, somewhere in the neighborhood between 25 and 35% of townhome units are rentals. So I don't want to leave that uh, data point out of it. Some of them are rentals, uh, but many of them are owner-occupied. And so in terms of just trying to achieve that end of creating more uh, affordable ownership opportunities, townhomes do serve an important role in that. Um, I know you guys have seen this many times, so I, I won't uh, belabor the point, but maybe more uh, for the most benefit for Commissioner McGovern, um, uh, maybe Glenn did, Glenn did some training about the pyramid of discretion. Uh, but the reason I raise this is that the rezoning and reguiding actions you take uh, have the highest level of discretion associated with them. So it's really your call according to the goals and strategies uh, and priorities of the comprehensive plan, whether or not to reguide and rezone a site. The reason I say that is that all of the way that our townhome development is currently structured is that it would always require uh, at minimum a rezoning and likely uh, a reguiding as well. So there is a high level of discretion. That's kind of how this process is currently set up. Um, uh, again, uh, mostly to uh, thinking about medium density residential land guidance, and we'll talk about where those land use categories land with some of that work that we do. Um, but all the projects you're looking at um, in terms of an approval standpoint, planning commission and city council, public hearings are both um, rezoning and typically reguiding. So that, that translates into this next discussion. So um, this is the this is snippets of the future uh, planned land use map, also with the uh, arterial and collector roads. 
um, uh, put on them. And so the medium density residential category talks about uh, having uh, uh, access to, uh, uh, I think it's encouraged is the term, having access to arterial and collector roads. So um, the, in the, uh, the, the medium color there in the middle of the three colors in the legend, uh, it's kind of a brown color. Those are areas in the city that are guided medium density residential. Most of those areas are townhomes. Not all of those areas are townhomes uh, currently, um, but that's where uh, a lot of your existing townhome sites are going to be guided medium density residential. Uh, in discussing ways that the city can uh, um, uh, encourage or spur more townhome development or development similar to townhomes from a density perspective, um, the city has a tool in its toolbox, uh, toolbox to proactively reguide. Uh, properties um, to higher levels of density, either medium density residential or uh, high density residential. And that's what that, that yellow areas are and kind of the dark red area are those are areas of the city that are currently actually single family residential uses that the city has proactively reguided as part of past uh, comprehensive plan uh, updates that we have done. Um, and uh, the results of that have been fairly uh, mixed if uh, I would say, uh, Glenn, can, if you want to input here, but uh, not a lot of development has been spurred by those proactive reguidings. Most of those areas have remained single family. Um, but I think in terms of it still being a, a tool, I still think it is a valuable tool because, uh, you know, it's one less hurdle or threshold to clear uh, for a developer. And I think it communicates as a city where we think higher densities of residential uses are appropriate. Um, so it's a tool that we can look at as part of our, you know, future comprehensive plan updates. Um, and that's something the city council has talked about is where townhomes are appropriate, maybe is uh, in close proximity to commercial nodes. Some of the commercial nodes have single family uh, uses around them, um, close to Old Cedar and Old Shock, for example, or other areas. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's a tool in the toolbox. Um, get into the zoning piece of it. Uh, townhomes uh, are allowed in those zoning districts on your slide there. Uh, from staff's perspective, we think the most common future townhomes you would see would either be zoned R3 or RM12. They're pretty similar uh, zoning districts, uh, although RM12 does allow uh, multifamily uses on the high end, but capped at 12 units to the acre, so it's kind of difficult to do that. Um, R3 has standards, performance standards, um, uh, that are more similar to single-family residential in terms of setbacks. Uh, it's not required to have access to arterial collector roads whereas RM12 has setbacks that are more akin to our multifamily districts and uh, does require access to arterial and collector roads. Uh, you can see kind of the density ranges of those uh, districts uh, there in the table, uh, but that just gives you a flavor of kind of what the regulatory environment is for townhomes. So in the report, I went, all, uh, I went into detail on all these different performance standards that we adopted in 2015. We don't have to go into those unless you have a specific question about one of them. But these are, again, back to that kind of concept about the levers that you can pull or change uh, to make it more feasible or less feasible. Uh, these are kind of some of the things that uh, we currently require uh, that we could look at. Um, one of, uh, um, on the recent townhome development and on prior ones, one of the things that we don't have memorialized standards on is secondary access, access to arterial collector roads, and visitor parking. So these are things that we could look at. Um, it's kind of a variety uh, in the existing townhome developments in the community. Some don't have secondary access, many do. Um, some are located cl uh, closer, have access to arterial collectors, some don't. Um, some of them have a more robust par visitor parking uh, supply than others. We don't have a standard in code. It's very vague and discretionary. It just states that guest parking must be provided. Um, so you could look at that one of two ways. One is you should just develop a requirement. The other is you can look at the characteristics of each development. If, if there's possibility for on-street, uh, on the private street parking, that kind of changes the game. So I'm, I'm thinking that's where some of that discretion came from, uh, but just things to consider. Um, and then just to wrap it up, uh, just some general uh, recommendations related to townhomes. Um, we'll report back to the city council on this too. Again, they requested this uh, kind of report. Um, but, you know, what kind of tools can the city do to um, spur or encourage townhome development? Again, we can proactively reguide. We have been doing some of that with mixed results, um, but we can look at additional areas in our next comprehensive plan amendment. Um, 
uh, or I should say the new one. Um, we can reduce off-street parking requirements. This is something that uh, probably should be looked at when we do our uh, when we when we looked at our multifamily uh, parking. So we can kind of uh, take lessons from both that and from the single-family uh, and two-family update and kind of tweak those a little bit. Maybe that could be a miscellaneous uh, or other minor amendment potentially. Um, we can assess our other performance standards, and then just finally, just to finish on this, is just that. Uh, the HRA with this new reorganization is going to have a new role uh, to play uh, in missing middle housing and potentially townhomes could be part of that. So if they were had the ability to acquire uh, a few lots and could get a you know small number of townhomes on, a, on say two parcels that used to have two dwellings, um, that would certainly be in keeping with uh, the vision and mission from my understanding. So yeah, that's it. Happy to take any questions and uh, suggestions or anything uh, of interest when it comes to townhomes. Only when I, um, <clears throat> and the things that you were thinking about, whether I think it was the previous slide, um, yeah, I, don't, I don't have strong opinions on any of these things. I think those are nice to have. I don't think they're necessary, uh, unless it's some very large development where a secondary access is because of just the sheer size. But, you know, I know we ran into that with the, the one that we recently worked through, and um, I think it's more a question of how do you design the, 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 the development or how do you, uh, you know, there's always going to be a tension of trying to maximize the amount of, of what you can build. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, <clears throat> um, you know, or the visitor parking question, you know, and again, I go back to the most recent one that we, we saw, you know, those, those had two car garages with spaces for two cars in a driveway. I think, in my opinion, that's probably plenty of, I mean, requiring visitor parking, again, if, we're, if our goal is to um, make more affordable options and encourage development of this type, if that's what we're, I assume that's what the council was interested in having us look at this for, was to try to encourage it more. I think, in, in my opinion, I think these are nice to have, not necessary. I agree. These are nice to have um, secondary access so long as there's an engineering review of the turning truck radius, which there always would be. Um, that's enough for me. Um, and uh, I still feel the same way I did about access to collector roads. For me, that's a traffic issue. And unless we have some very large developments, no amount of townhomes is going to create a traffic problem. And, uh, you know, visitor parking, I'm not in favor of necessarily striking it, but looking at our numbers to see if it's too aggressive is so I'm fine with that. I'm pretty neutral. Yeah. Yeah. Um, other things that you were looking for thoughts on? No. Okay. Again, I think it's good to go back and kind of reassess some of these, uh, the supply of housing that we don't talk, uh, housing type that we don't talk about a lot. So um, it was at least a good refresher for uh, staff in that respect, and hopefully it's informative for Planning Commission and Council too. Okay. Good. All right. Um, item number three we'll return to, which is the annual miscellaneous issues ordinance review. Uh, I think Planner Rick Bile has that one for us. Um, we will not have former... Um, Planner Palermo's animations this year. <laughs> no, no pressure. I thought about it. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm new, so got to play it safe, right? You'll have your own your own flair, I'm sure. Yeah. <laughs> Just you wait. Um, let's see here. Stop. <clears throat> All right. All right, so it is once again time for miscellaneous issues ordinance. So, um, Commissioner McGovern, I think you're the. This is your first, your first rally with miscellaneous issues. Um, yes, is. So, uh, miscellaneous issues. They are um, every year we collectively um, gather, um, review, write 
um, several minor ordinances that um, typically on their own do not merit the full review going through a study, planning commission, city council. Um, so we, we just kind of bunch them all together. And so that's, that's what we're doing here tonight. And, um, and so our timeline, if, if everything goes as planned, is that we're, we're presenting here tonight. Um, we will be submitting our ordinances for legal review. And then um, if all goes as planned, you will see us in November again with uh, having taken in your, uh, your recommendations and considerations and thoughts, and then um, to city council in December. Um, so how we're going to run this this evening is um, Planner O'Day and I, we have bunched um, some of the, what we consider to be more substantive ordinances together. And those are at the end of the alphabet. So that is P, Q, R, and S. So we will actually present those first and then we'll stop and we'll take comments from you. And then the other items, which seem to be more um, cleaning, clarifying, um, or bringing into alignment, um, those are A through O. And so we'll go through those again and then we'll stop and we can review those if that seems like a good way to do it. And I think so, given that those, the first ones are usually more minor in nature, I think if, if there's anything that stands out to you as we're going, just feel free to, to mention it. Otherwise we can just okay. stay, yeah. Great, okay, so, um, okay, so P, body art is first. Um, so if you, if you look at the use table, um, body art establishment, which are um, tattoo and piercing parlors, um, Right now, they are relegated to B2 and C2, um, which is very different than uh, retail sales and services, which is a very similar use type. And we believe this to be because of the historic stigmatization of tattoos and piercing parlors. Um, and so we looked at this as, um, as staff and we thought that it was out of date and that it um, is warranted to update the standards such that it um, matches retail sales and services. So that's this one. Um, on that one. Um, and I think about this, given the, the hearing we had earlier tonight, which was, you know, sometimes these establishments have later hours. Mm -hmm. um, and we're talking about a, we're expanding the permitted areas, which I don't have a problem with in concept. Um, but thinking about the, the, the hearing we heard earlier and, and neighbors concerned about some of this neighborhood commercial that's adjacent to residential. Um, and we don't have any standard hours that would be, uh, that would apply to a business if it, they were coming in for a permitted use, correct? I have to defer to. Yeah, Chair Roland, um, commissioners, the city does not have any standards on hours of operation, you know, by zoning district or anything like that. an observation yeah okay do you want to move on sure okay all right so Q uh, the accessory dwelling unit utility hookup requirement so the current um, the current uh, code prohibits um, uh, sites to be uh, from having separate hookup and meter, which is um, actually contradicts the guidance of the engineering department. And so our proposed amendment would change the provision to require separate utility services and metering for accessory dwelling units, except with permission from the utility division and city engineer. What's the, what's the rationale for that? Do you know? Um, I think, uh, can I defer to you, Glenn, <laughs> <laughs> on that one? You were in that yeah. conversation. Yeah, uh, Chair Roman, I was in that meeting, but I am forgetting myself. <laughs> That's okay. <laughs> the rationale. That's okay, because I, I, my opinion probably will be the same regardless of the rationale. But we require owner occupancy for ADU, and we're trying to encourage ADUs as a affordable option. Uh, and I don't know that requiring separate metering and the cost that that encounter incurs, both from 
building the ADU and then ongoing monthly. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a franchise fee and a meter fee and all these things. It, it feels like it's for something that is an owner occupied requirement. Um, I, I'm not feeling that one. Yeah, sure, Roman. We do have uh, Mr. Hansen on the line. If uh, sure, maybe, I don't know if Brian, if you have any insights on that question. Yeah, thanks, Glenn. Uh, commissioners, um, I think one of the reasons that uh, engineering uh, would like to have those separate hookups is to ensure that uh, we are able to track and monitor the usage of water and sanitary from these buildings. Um, you know, as you know, for uh, commercial buildings or any building, really we require those uh, lines to be metered within 10 feet of the exterior wall where they enter that building. So if we have multiple units that are running off of one line, um, there are some concerns if there are some illegal taps or or some things that are circumventing our meters. So we want to make sure that we have each line isolated. So that's one of the reasons our utilities division. So we're, talk, we're talking about freestanding ADUs. Correct. Correct. Yes. If it's attached to the, if it's attached to the building and I, I don't want to contradict uh, 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 Mallory and, and Liz's update, but yeah, if it's attached to the building, I think that's, we, that's look, we looked at it differently and that's maybe why that language is in there at, at the discretion of the city engineer or the utilities division, but if they're separate units, separate buildings, on the same lot, we'd want to have separate meters and separate lines to those. I think that would, I you know, make sure it's clear that if it's an ADU that's maybe in my basement, that, that would that would be, I, I would find that to be an onerous cost that would not be necessary versus I understand the idea if I have an ADU in my backyard that is a separate building. Um, so thank and you. And I believe that's why that language exists to allow the discretion of the city engineer and the utilities uh, superintendent to make that decision on a situation just like that. I hear you. I, I and I would be more comfortable being clear that uh, if it's not detached, it that, that's my opinion. Okay. And I would agree with your opinion. I second that. <laughs> All right. Okay. <clears throat> Moving on. Um, change in condition to notice boundaries. Um, so. Uh, the current change uh, in condition standards require a 500 foot mail notice boundary, even if the condition itself only required 200 feet, uh, 200 foot uh, boundary. So um, what this proposed amendment is going to do is to update the application processes and fees table to denote that the notice boundary as part of a change in a condition application shall adhere to the notice boundaries with the that the original condition um, is attached. I agree. Okay. Great. Okay. And then um, the final of the more substantive changes um, is that right now there's no exception for platting requirements for government owned facilities. And so we added an exception to include city owned parcels um, that exceed a thousand square feet. Can you give some more background on why a park or something would need to be replatted. So you're putting up some accessory structure and then that triggers some replat and you got to replat an entire park. Is that the idea? Um, Glenn, do you yeah. want to add? Uh, Chair Roman, Commissioner Cookton. So um, one of the triggers for platting is that if you have a building permit for a new building and there's already an exception if it's a thousand square feet or less, but what we ran into recently was a, a situation in which very large park, um, they wanted to do a building over 1,000 square feet, and then that would trigger platting, which would require uh, surveying of that very, very large area. So it would have been massively expensive. Um, so this is meant to get at that type of situation. Just so I understand, isn't every parcel already platted? Uh, Chair Roman, Commissioner Cookton, no. A, a lot of parcels, especially these large park parcels, are not platted. Uh, they're meets and bounds descriptions, so they're not not formally platted. What is meets and bounds? Uh, so it is a, a legal description that generally says, you know, uh, starting at point whatever, and then running 50 feet this way and 
and then at an angle or a curve going so far that way and kind of describing the the boundaries verbally whereas a plat would actually show the uh, configuration and the bearings and the dimensions of all the the parcel subsegments. So it's a formalization of property bounds. Yes. Okay. And would the descript with the de definition of government and park facilities would that include public schools as well? That, didn't we run into this when we had the chiller project at Oak Grove? Something yes, thing? Uh, chair room, and, and it would include, uh, yeah. The public schools as well. Okay. Sounds good to me. Okay. All right. So now we move into more of the cleanup and clarification issues. Oh, wait. I can talk into this one. Okay. All right. So for this one, the city code allows a major catering business as a permitted use in the I-1, I-2, I-3 zoning district, but not in the FD-2 zoning district. Catering is similar to food manufacturing and um, restaurants, which are permitted uses in FD-2 zoning districts. So this would just merely add uh, permitted use for major catering in FD-2. Um, the next one, um, catering business minor clarification. So um, when catering business minor was uh, defined, it was intended to include a reference to mobile food units um, that will be affiliated with the use. Um, and that part was inadvertently missed when it <laughs> went into city code. And so um, now the document is currently incomplete so this proposed amendment would be to add the words mobile food unit at the end of the definition to complete the definition okay uh, the exterior storage ordinance has standards for uh, residential and industrial zoning districts but the business district is rather limited um, the city has seen issues with businesses uh, having uh, merchandise and items outside so this would add the standards for the residential and industrial to the business um, districts can you explain this a little more so is a business precluded from putting things outside they're not precluded they have to meet these standards such as not blocking sidewalks and um, uh, not blocking uh, required parking spaces. So they're the same standards as the residential and um, industrial zoning districts. They're just copy and pasting and p including it in the business district. Thank you. Okay, move forward. Okay, so the tent code. Um, so the definition of tent does not reference uh, the composite frame. Um, as part of the structure, which has resulted in some compliance issues. And so our, um, our proposed amendment is to update the definition of tent to include reference to the composite parts, um, which includes frame, cover, canvas, stakes, beams, ropes, and cables. I didn't really understand this. Can you give an example of a problem that's come up? Yeah, um, I, I believe that there has been an issue with um, a, a tent that has exceeded the amount of days that tents are allowed to be erected. And so the uh, property owner had took basically the canvas or the like the, the covering and then left the poles in place so that the tent is really still um, up but the, uh, the cover isn't over it. And so this has, has resulted in some compliance issues for, for a tent structure. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll move on. Okay. Uh, a couple years ago, the CO2 zoning district was completely removed from city code except for one little reference. So this just removes that old reference. Okay, um, 
As part of our shore area regulation definition of noxious weed, it references a Minnesota state statute that has since been repealed. So our uh, proposed amendment would remove the outdated state statute. Um, for minimum off-street parking requirements, um, the table uh, that explains seasonal outdoor dining seating um, contains a reference that is on um, the first row. You can see that it says one space is per three seats, but um, the uh, exception um, lists it as one space per 2.5. So the proposed amendment would just change the numbers so that it matches the uh, the current requirement. Um, senior party room standards with multi-unit parking updates. The city did remove party room from the calculation for multifamily residential, but the party room requirement remains with uh, senior housing. So this uh, would remove the party room parking requirements for senior housing. How does the code qualify something as senior housing? Can I, uh, Planner yeah. Market Guard, can I <laughs> defer to you? Chair Roman, uh, Commissioner Cookton, there is a, a definition and it uh, talks about age restricted housing. So uh, generally it's 55 and over. So the developer has to have something on the books with the city saying they're not going to rent or lease these units to folks under 55? That's correct. Okay, thank you. I had that same question a couple weeks ago when we had that project recently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, especially as we talked about parking and things of that nature, and so it's a it's a good question. It's just thirty three years away or twenty two years away. <laughs> 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 yeah, no, 20, 23. Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, so there's an er error in wording for our cart storage. Um, it is just to remove uh, an, a word that uh, says must to be shown, and uh, we prefer the more colloquial accepted must be shown. So this proposed amendment um, proposes to update that. Um, J, work vehicle parking storage. Um, this one, um, it, this is a currently administered practice of separating uh, work vehicle parking. So these are vehicles that are owned by the business um, from the parking requirement for commercial uses. It's never been reflected in city code. And so the proposed amendment would be to create a requirement um, as part of our parking use standards to exclude spaces for business owned vehicles from the required number and to show on a plan um, if requested. Um, the city code does not allow temporary fences for residential zoning districts. Uh, uh, however, this proposed amendment would allow for um, temporary fences for construction and excavation um, purposes for um, uh, an issue that arose was a fire, the fire station that was being built wasn't allowed a temporary fence. So this would allow the fire station and other park structures to put up a temporary fence because they're located in residential zoning districts. Okay, moving on. Um, open storage as a primary use. Um, so the code references open storage as a principal use, which is outdated. So we just suggest to remove the provision that refers to open storage as a principal use. The code has site width um, standards and has a diagram within uh, that code section. However, the old diagram didn't include, didn't have or accurately reflect a curved setback line. So this proposed amendment would uh, accurate, accurately reflect that curved set, setback point and also include a rectil, rectilinear, or it's yep. a really hard word to say, um, uh, typical lot. Okay, so um, right now city code does not expressly prohibit home businesses to conduct on-site sales of motor vehicles that are not registered to the property owner or resident. And this has resulted in some enforcement issues. Um, so 
uh, we propose to specify that the on sales of vehicles uh, not registered to the property owner or resident as a prohibited home-based business. And then lastly, the city recently put all the city application fees into Appendix A of the code, so it just removes all old references to our fee schedule. Go back to the previous one. Mm-hmm. Is there, even within that, is there any kind of a, a limit? Because I could envision <clears throat> I decide to essentially run a something like that out of my property, and I might have 20 vehicles registered in my name. Mm. Do we, I just wonder if there's any kind of, if there should be any sort of a numerical restriction on that at any, I don't know, I'm just thinking out loud. Because it, clearly we're adding it because it's been an issue. Yep. And so if we're gonna clean it up, how should we, how clean should it be? Right. Um, and so this would prohibit you from selling a vehicle that is not in your name. Correct. What if I have like an elderly parent and I'm selling her a vehicle, could I do that? You can sign a registration over to a family member, right? In Minis- I'm new, that new back in Minnesota. I, before I left, you could do that. But um, no, that's, that's a good question. Um, I suppose uh, it's an interesting point. I, I suppose that you could, um, like if, so you are selling you know, your parents' vehicle at your location as opposed to at their house. Right. And that, okay. Maybe they moved into an assisted living center. Okay. But I, I, again, it goes, for me, it goes back to, you know, and I don't have any clue what this would be, but should there be a number attached to this, you know, not more than, not to exceed a certain number without Mm -hmm. permit? I I, I don't know. Chair Roman, what, one thing that may help on that, under state uh, law, there's a limit of five vehicles that you can sell, um, and after that, you become a dealer. And then if you become a dealer, the um, state says you have to get city sign-off on your location. Um, Perfect. So that could help. That's five, is that's in a year? Five per year. What does it mean to sell a vehicle? So I have a vehicle and I sell it online and the actual transaction of papers happens, I don't know, here at City Hall. Is that allowed or what does that mean? Like what does it mean to sell a vehicle? Yeah. Chair Rowan, Commissioner Cookton, a good question. Um, So, yeah, it talks about on-site sales. Um, So I suppose that could include a a mixture of, you know, people coming to visit, to look at the vehicle, test drive it, and then actually, you know, conducting the paperwork to turn it over. Um, Probably any of those three uh, activities could be on-site sales. I be- if I can add, I believe the main issue is the display of the vehicles for sale um, on the property is is where the complaints that cannot be remediated with the code as written. Yeah, Mr. Chair, and that, that may bring up a, a potential addition to say on-site sales and display of vehicles. That's a, and it's an interesting one too that goes to uh, you know, I think back to one of our times that we discussed RV standards uh, and all of the um, gnashing of teeth over how long a might be parked in a driveway or in front of the house, um, and that we don't have any requirement around how often a vehicle in a driveway needs to move. Uh, I could have an inoperable vehicle in my driveway for three years. Uh, and so as we think about this question and the display of a vehicle do it, and it we may not have, probably don't have time at this point in this year's but 
think about it in relation to, in general, um, uh, inoperable or vehicles that don't move, whether it's for sale or not, because I think it creates a, probably a similar type of an issue that we're trying to mitigate here. Mm-hmm. Just a thought. I feel like I could keep poking some holes here, but it's not worth it. I, unless this is a major problem, um, I think we should take a do what we're proposing here, and then if it continues to be a problem, then we start sure. getting into all the loopholes. Yep. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. All right. Um, item number six. Uh, there, since there are only three of us left, that is not. Uh, enough to approve a meeting synopsis, correct? Um, Chair Roman, Even that's technically correct. A study item. That's correct. So that will automatically continue to the next meeting? We don't Mr. Have enough- Chair, yes. it was my understanding that you only needed to have a majority of people present. At the meeting? And there Chair were only Roman. six commissioners present at that meeting. And so is three considered a majority or four considered a majority in that case? Uh, four would be a majority. Very well. Okay. So then we don't have enough of us to take a vote. So the votes to automatically continue then to the next meeting? Yeah, we can do that. Okay. Is there a motion to? I don't know that we can because we there's not enough of us to. <laughs> so we have to sit here until our next meeting. We yes. can't leave the building. <laughs> so I think we just, uh, the, the chair removes item six from the agenda. That's the prerogative of the chair maybe, I guess. I don't know if that's how that works. Uh, item number seven is follow up on the uh, joint board and commission meeting. Uh, Planning manager Marker Guard circulated the information about that um, and uh, had an opportunity to check in with folks. And is there anyone here who would like to be considered for that uh, opportunity? Uh, Mr. Chair, it would be my opinion that the chair should represent the planning commission in this case so i would ask you if you are willing to do so i second that sure happy to do that then i think for me that's what's appropriate okay i agree that's what you need then for that glenn i think so yep it'll be me yep all right sounds good um and then the last item is a policy and issue update Yes, uh, Chair Roman, Commissioners, looking forward at our next two Planning Commission meetings on the October 27th. Uh, we have a couple items. There is a request for major revision of final development plans for a clubhouse expansion. That's at the Hampshire Hill apartment complex, uh, 10700 Hampshire Avenue South. And then we have a city code amendment uh, regarding the expiration of final development plans. That is a city-initiated uh, code amendment. And then finally, a proposed uh, street name change of Picture Drive. And uh, that's a uh, public hearing on that. And looking uh, beyond that, November 3rd, uh, a couple items. One is an expansion of the Hieropolis restaurant, uh, which would include a rezoning uh, preliminary final development plans, conditional use permit, and the preliminary final plat. That's at 9000 uh, Penn Avenue South. And then a uh, review of the TIF proposal uh, for compliance with the comprehensive plan for Oxborough Heights. That's the development that was before you recently at 600 West 93rd Street. So that's what we have on upcoming agendas. Anything any members of the commission would like to to bring up? No? All right. Well, seeing none, then the uh, planning commission is adjourned until October 27th. Thank you.